Well, welcome to worship at Mountain View. We are glad you're with us this weekend. It is a wonderful weekend. We are our first Sunday after Thanksgiving, so hopefully you had a safe and grateful Thanksgiving. It is also our first weekend of our new Christmas series that you'll hear a little bit more about in just a second. But if you are new to Mountain View or if you would like to submit a prayer request, find an easy way to give or just quick links to all kinds of great information, the best thing to do is to go to mtnvw.org slash hub. And right there you'll find quick links to all sorts of great places. We are starting a new series called Traditions. We're going to be preaching out of the book of Hebrews for the next five weeks as we turn our face towards Christmas and what that means for each and every one of us. We're going to start our worship with a time of singing. We're going to have a time of teaching. We're going to close our service with communion and worship. We're glad that you're with us. If you're here in the room, or if you're worshiping online, we're worshiping together. So let's all stand. Let's sing together. Get out, church. Don't let your heart be troubled, no. Hold your head up, I don't feel no evil. And fix your eyes on this one truth. God, he's madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Creation, everything with breath. Re- 
Amen. I want to ask you something, church. Do you ever find it difficult to worship God through song? Maybe when the words speak greater truth than our pride wants to admit. Still we sing to him and we sing to one another. And that's what this next song is all about. Sing as you know it, friends. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his, his face toward you and give you peace. And all his children said,
let's sing one more to him. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Church, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for these words that you allow us to sing. You give us an opportunity to praise you in such a special way. And we love using music as a vessel of worship. So, Father, we ask you to continue to move in us as we, as we prepare our tithes and offerings. We're just so grateful for the gifts that you've given us. And we just want to give a little bit back to you, Father. In your son's wonderful name, we all said, amen. Y'all can have a seat. coming along. I'm almost done over here. Pretty good. 
You know, I think this I do one side, you do the other is a really, really good idea. I think so too. So much faster. What do you have over there? A Christmas tree. <laughs> no, but your ornaments don't match my ornaments. Yes, yours looks like Grandma's house. Yes. That wasn't a compliment. Red is Christmas. Christmas is not bad peppermint. Christmas is red. This is how we always do it at Christmas. No. And this is how we should do it at Christmas. No. I just think this looks better. No. It does not look better. You need to take it off. No. Well, welcome once again. You will be seeing uh, those two throughout our entire Christmas series, so keep watch for them each weekend as we continue our Christmas series heading towards Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We are glad you are worshiping with us again if you are online or here in person. If my two sermons this morning seem a little short and you wonder where I'm going this afternoon, I have been warming up my, my football, my throwing arm, so just in case the Broncos need a quarterback, I... I am available for the league minimum for one game. Uh, I'd be glad to, to sit in and actually I may not be able to enjoy it after one game. Probably would have a concussion or two. But we are glad you are with us. If you're not a football fan, the Broncos have lost all four of their quarterbacks for today's game. So they're actually starting an undrafted player who they actually signed as a wide receiver. So that makes total sense. So Steve, it's a shame we're not playing the Chiefs today, right? That would just be icing on the cake. We are glad you are with us. It is Christmas season, even though in 2020, it may not feel like a normal Christmas season. Uh, I recognize that things are different. Uh, we did go out on Friday. Uh, we went to Southwest Plaza, walked around. It was a ghost town. Uh, it was just not anything like it would have been in 2019 or 18 or 17 or, or any of those days. But even still, with 2020 and everything that we've gone through and still going through uh, and we get to this time of year. For most of us, it just begins to feel normal. There are things that happen that we expect to happen. We hear Christmas songs on the radio. Uh, we hear, you know, Christmas songs that are streaming on Spotify. Hallmark, Hallmark Channel, you know, has their Christmas movies. Christmas stores, you know, Christmas sales. You know, Christmas just feels like a normal part of our life. And when we think about Christmas... We think about these kind of predictable patterns. You know, when people put up their lights, when the music starts, you know, all of those kinds of things. And we have this tendency to think as modern people, it's always been this way. This has just always been kind of the rhythm to life. This has always been one of those seasons that people have always looked forward to. And there's always been these rhythms and traditions. And yet it's not been that way at all. In fact, if you're to go back through church history, it's only in the third century, so some 300 years after Jesus, that the church began celebrating Christmas as a church function. For 300 years, the church existed and never once had a Christmas cantata or a Christmas Eve service or Christmas nothing. In the 1200s, that's when the first nativity scenes start to come around. In the 1500s, is when Christmas trees became common. For those of us who look forward each year to different movies and such, it was 1965 when Charlie Brown Christmas first was produced, first came on the air. We think of many of our traditions as things that have just always been. And yet when you look back over the story of the church, it's not been the case. In fact, what we find predictable at Christmas time when it comes to Christmas lights and Christmas carols and all of those kinds of things, the first century believers, the first century Jewish people, would have thought the arrival of Jesus was anything but predictable. They had been looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, for hundreds, for thousands of years. And when Jesus arrived on the scene, everything about Jesus was anything but predictable. How he comes into the world. Not your normal kind of way of coming into the world. How he lived, he did some unpredictable things. How he died, his message. Everything about Jesus was not predictable. The things that we find comforting, reassuring, the traditions that we appreciate. For a first century person, there was none of that. 
In fact, what is our challenge as modern day people who are looking back through 2,000 years of history, 2,000 years of accumulated tradition, and trying to recapture the message of Jesus. I want to frame it for you this way, so if you want to write this down or take a picture, if you're watching online, you can kind of just open up a tab, you know, start some notes. But here's the main thing that we're going to talk about this weekend. It's this right here. And that is to understand Jesus. It requires us to capture how revolutionary Jesus was, and I believe how revolutionary Jesus still is. That our challenge as modern-day people is to not assume, to not just think that we already know, to fall back into the rhythms, the patterns, the habits, but to go and recapture who Jesus really was. And when you begin to study the life of Jesus from the original sources, from the Bible, not what we've accumulated over church history, when you begin to go back and look at Jesus, you begin to appreciate he was truly revolutionary. In fact, as we're headed into this Christmas season, as we were doing our series planning, kind of our idea shaping and our messages, we were thinking about where to kind of base this this series out of. And we landed on the book of Hebrews, not the usual Christmas text. You know, it's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, one of the four gospels, the biographies of Jesus. It's not Matthew or Luke who tell the birth story, you know, who actually take you to Bethlehem and the donkeys and the wise men. It's the book of Hebrews, the one book in the New Testament that we don't know for certain who writes the book. It's the anonymous book. It's written to people who believe in Jesus, but it's written to people who believe in Jesus who came out of a Jewish background. And these Jewish believers in Jesus are struggling because many of them lost family members, lost friends, lost their jobs. And they're being persecuted for being a Christian. More than that, some of them are immature. And I don't mean just adolescent, young, you know, 10, 11, 12-year-olds. They are immature when it comes to the faith. They've been around church for a while now. They've heard about Jesus. They've been following him in some cases for a few years. And yet the writer will say several times, you need to grow up. You're not where you need to be. You know, you ought to be further down the line than you are right now. And so the book is written really for one main reason, and that is to keep these Jewish Christians who are thinking of giving up and walking away from their faith to give them every good reason not to do that. And the one thread that runs all through the book of Hebrews is this. Jesus is who he claimed to be. And what he claimed to be was not average or ordinary. It was revolutionary back in the first century. And I believe today. So we're going to be basing our next five messages out of the book of Hebrews. If you've not read it, it's near the end of the New Testament. You can read it in one or two sittings. It's a fantastic book about Jesus. So here's how the book begins. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In the past... God spoke to our ancestors. He's writing to Jewish people, so he's talking about their Jewish ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom, meaning Jesus, he also made the universe. Here's what I want you to do for a moment. One of our challenges in reading Scripture is that we read Scripture through our modern lens. And so we kind of already skip, you know, skip past things we think we know. We don't hear the impact of certain things. And so I want you to use your imagination this morning. I want you to, for a moment, imagine that you're a first century Jewish person, not a believer in Jesus, not somebody who has given your life to Christ, you know, somebody who maybe has heard of Christ, heard of Jesus, but you're undecided. And you're a first century Jewish person. You're walking around in those first century days in your sandals. You know, you're going to the open air market, buying your food. What would you have thought of Jesus? If you had a chance encounter, you perhaps passed him at a corner and he's talking to a few folks. 
What, what if one of your cousins comes and tells you about, about Jesus? What would you have thought about Jesus? If you're that first century, normal, average, ordinary person, and you hear about Jesus, you hear his story, his background, perhaps you walk past him. Would you look at Jesus and think, this person speaks for God? That's the challenge. Because in the first century, they had some real hurdles. Hurdles that ironically, in some ways, in some cases, we actually honor and celebrate. The biggest hurdle is the Christmas story itself, this questionable birth of Jesus. We set out nativity scenes. We sing Christmas carols about the birth of Jesus and Silent Night. And for us, that idea, that Bethlehem story is a good story. If you're a first century Jewish person of decent common sense and intelligence, and somebody tries to convince you, that this guy, Jesus, you know, he wasn't born the normal kind of way through the normal course of things. His mother was a virgin, and she was a teenager, and he was born into a very nondescript family, not born into royalty, not born into money. His dad is a blue-collar carpenter, and yet they're trying to convince you that he's the son of God. When it comes to his teaching, you know, as a Jewish person, you've been in Hebrew school. You know, you've sat in, in synagogue, and, and you've heard people teach who, who taught, who were smart, who were intelligent, and they had all the right rabbi credentials. They went to the right schools. They sat under the right teachers. And yet there are some people who, who are, are calling Jesus a rabbi, and yet he, he never went to school for that. In fact, we don't know if Jesus went to any school beyond what he had to do as a small child. He doesn't have any of the credentials. And you're looking at this person, Jesus, and you're thinking, he's an unlikely spokesperson for God. But here's how we think. We look back kind of through our 21st century eyes, and here's how I think. Maybe you think this way. How could they have missed it? How could they have missed Jesus? You know, how could they have missed all the dots, you know, connecting all the dots? How could they have missed the wisdom? How could they have missed the miracles? And we look back and we think, how could they have missed Jesus? Honestly, it wasn't that hard. Jesus wasn't from a fancy family. He wasn't from... A wealthy family wasn't from the Ivy League. Jesus was just normal. In fact, he was so normal that when Isaiah the prophet predicts the coming of the Messiah, he says that the coming Messiah is going to have nothing in his appearance that will attract us to him. He'll go on to say, no majesty, no no beauty. In other words, Jesus is not the standout. He's not head and shoulders above everybody. He's not the one that you pass and go, that's got to be the guy. He's just normal. And that first century Jewish person, as you're walking along in the open air market, you know, you know, you're past Jesus and you don't even know this. Here's what's incredible. It's remarkable that Jesus And God, that God spoke through Jesus 2,000 years ago, it's remarkable today. But here's the thing. It's not surprising that God would speak to his people. In fact, as early as the first two chapters of the Bible, back in the Garden of Eden, God is trying to communicate to his people. He's trying to get a message to them. That, that, that way of communicating, sometimes it's a, a burning bush. Sometimes it's a, a pillar of fire. There's the occasional angel that, that will show up, you know, startle everybody around. But most often, whenever God spoke to people, he would speak to his people through his prophets. 
We spent three weeks, the last three weeks, in one of those prophets, Micah. There are others, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea. There's a whole list of prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures. And God would speak to his people through his prophets. I want to ask you a question. How many of you like to do crossword puzzles? Or crossword puzzles, oh my goodness. That's funny. How many of you like to do jigsaw puzzles? I actually do know what this is, by the way. I'm hiding this side because it's a dinosaur. So I'm not showing you that side. So how many of you like to do jigsaw puzzles? Anybody like to do jigsaw puzzles? How many of you did... I don't know how many puzzles during COVID-19. You know, back in, in March, April, you know, we went to Target one time to buy a jigsaw puzzle. There was one left. You know, they, they just kind of cleaned out toilet paper and jigsaw puzzles. You know, so jigsaw puzzles. You know, if you're online, you did a jigsaw puzzle recently, tell us what it is. You know, so jigsaw puzzles are interesting because you, you get different sizes. You know, 100 pieces, 500 pieces. You got those, those monster jigsaw puzzles, you know, 5,000 pieces. And each piece is important. You don't want to lose a single piece. You don't want to lose two or three pieces. You know, because you're trying to find where they fit with another piece. And over time, you put them each together and they form a picture. But no one piece by itself is the complete picture. The Hebrew writer says that in the past, God spoke to his people in many times in various ways through prophets. Each of those prophets would bring a piece of the puzzle. Information, maybe a promise or a prophecy or a prediction, and they'd bring a piece of the puzzle, but, but by itself it wasn't the whole puzzle. In fact, the puzzle piece, you know, puzzle pieces, what they're putting together, the image that they finally shape is Jesus. But here's the thing, and don't make this mistake. Don't think that Jesus just brought another message from God. He is the message. It's not that he's one more piece of the puzzle. Jesus is the completed puzzle. He's what the picture on the box looks like. When you look at the old covenant, you start in Genesis and you go through the end of Malachi, and you look at the old covenant, the old covenant, the Hebrew scriptures, they're promising the coming of a savior. It's the new covenant that fulfills it. It's the new covenant that brings Jesus. And Jesus isn't just another message. He is the message. And what is that message? To understand the message that Jesus brought, you really have to understand a little bit about the old covenant, about what, what Jesus was fulfilling, what, what, what Jesus was sent to complete. In the old covenant, the, the original way that God related to his people, you have this system set up of how they can do different things to accomplish different things, to, to move closer to God, you know, to be able to understand God, try to grasp God. And so in the old covenant way of doing things, they first started before Solomon builds a temple. They have kind of a, a portable mobile you know, worship place. It's called a tabernacle. And the tabernacle and the temple both have the same room. And it's a room called the Holy of Holies. It's quite a name. A little bit intimidating. You know, it's not just, it's not just holy. You know, this is the holiest of, of the holies. And, and so this portable tabernacle, this permanent temple, they both would have this room called the Holy of Holies. And it was a room that is separated from the rest of the tabernacle, the rest of the temple, by this heavy curtain that, that, that literally hangs between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the building. And this heavy curtain is there for a reason. It's a barrier. God resides in the holiest of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence, it's inside this holy of the holies. And this curtain says, stay out. Except for one day. One day out of the entire year. The priest, but not any priest. Not a, a regular priest, not the JV, the, the, the high priest is able to go into the Holy of Holies, but only one day out of the entire year. This day in Jewish tradition is called Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. 
And this high priest would, would go behind the curtain on this one day. And, and as soon as he gets in, the very first thing he does is he offers a sacrifice for his own sins. For who he is. And then he offers a sacrifice for the sins of his people. That's the old covenant way of relating to God. And Jesus is born into this system. And this is what Jesus is coming into. And I want you to hold that thought for a moment. And here's what I want us to do. I want us to fast forward past Christmas. I want us to keep our, our hand down on the button. And I want to go past Christmas. And I want to go the next three years of Jesus' life. And I want to go right to the very last breath of Jesus. It's Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. The writer Matthew records how Jesus dies this way. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, what's he talking about? The moment Jesus died. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What happens at the very moment that Jesus gives up his spirit? That curtain is torn. What does that mean? I'm going to call an audible, and I'm going to let the Hebrew writer explain. Here's what he says, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. Now, there have been many of those priests, and what he's talking about, you know, he's talking about regular priests, high priest. He's saying, under the old covenant, we had a lot of priests, not just in one year, but over hundreds of years, over thousands of years. You know, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. He's stating the obvious. Why was there a turnover in priest? Because the priest died. And then a new one comes along, and that one dies. And then, but notice verse 24. But because Jesus lives forever... He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. What is the message of Christ? What's the complete picture? I really want you to hear this. There doesn't have to be a barrier between you and God. That temple curtain, it was torn 2,000 years ago. Doesn't matter how old you are, your age, your gender, your social status, your education, whether or not you like to drink coffee, none of those things are barriers. But it gets even better. According to the gospel, even your sin no longer has to be a barrier between you and God. Your sin, your guilt, your shame, and it doesn't matter how long you've been carrying your shame. It doesn't matter if you've been carrying your shame for 25 years or 25 minutes. You don't have to carry it one minute longer. When Jesus breathed his last, his work was finished. And what he accomplished is that temple curtain that had stood for thousands of years as a reminder to people like you and me. You don't belong in there. You don't belong in there. Maybe the best out of all of you can go in one day out of the year, but for the rest of you, you don't belong in there. And what happens when Jesus dies? That curtain is torn. The gospel says that you no longer have to carry 
your sin and your shame. That what has been a barrier between you and God, and most likely between you and others, maybe between who you are and who God wants you to be, that barrier no longer has to exist. For some of you, it does. The you know, temple curtain, it's been torn. But it doesn't mean that you've gone in. And so what might be your next step? You hear us talk about this a lot at Mountain View, and it's important. Because the only way you get where God wants you to be is to be moving in that direction. And for some of you, it's to start moving. You've been stationary. Maybe you've been going the opposite direction. And one of the things we talk a lot about here at Mountain View is this idea of saying yes to Jesus. That when I say, I say yes to something, by default, I'm saying no to other things. And that when I say yes to Jesus, when I decide to surrender my life to Christ, what I'm saying yes to is a new life. Because I'm saying yes to a new Lord and to a new Savior. I've been dragging my own guilt and shame, trying my best to get my way through life. And it's like trying to travel through the airport carrying 15 different suitcases. And God says, you don't have to do that. If you'll just surrender. For some of you who are watching, for some of you who are in the room, your first step is just that, the first step. It's to surrender. And if that's you, what I want you to do is text this phrase, yes to Jesus, to that number that's on your screen. If you need to write it down, if you need to take a screenshot, however you need to capture it, capture it. But I want to speak perhaps to the rest of us because there's a second keyword that's up on your screen. I know many Christians who understand intellectually this idea that the curtain has been torn and that God has, through Jesus, provided access and he's willing to forgive my sin and lift my shame, and yet you still carry it. Unnecessarily so. You're weighed down with your sin and your shame. If I were to ask you, has it been forgiven? You would say, yeah, of course, God, yes, Jesus did that. But then you carry it every day. What many Christians struggle to really fully embrace is God's grace. The idea that it's free, you don't have to work to earn it. Not the first time, not ever. And the idea that forgiveness is complete. So if that's you, if you struggle with still kind of carrying remnants of your guilt and your shame and fully embracing God's forgiveness, what I want you to do is text that phrase, God's grace, to that same phone number. And here's what you're going to get for five days. We've put together just each day a daily reminder that God loves you and that God has forgiven you. What we need to convince ourselves of is that's true. Some of you need to take that first step. Some of you just need to be reminded that God, through Jesus, is the one who is able to save completely. That's what the writer says. And who always lives to intercede. The resurrection of Christ means he's not dead. And he's not finished. That right now, what is he doing? He's making your case before God. That's powerful. And some of you need to accept that the first time. Some of you need to learn to walk in that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this reminder from the Hebrew writer that Jesus wasn't just another representative of God. It wasn't just another of your prophets, another piece in the puzzle, that he is the puzzle. And he speaks for you because he is you. And Father, I pray that that for those who have not yet 
accepted the fact that this veil, this curtain has been torn. We still feel separated on the outside of your presence because they don't feel worthy. They don't feel good enough or ready. But you will convince them that they will never be good enough but they are worthy because of what Jesus has done, our high priest. And we thank you. We give you all the praise and the honor through Jesus. Amen. Hey, everyone. Now's a good time to gather your elements for communion. Today, Ken talked to us about how God speaks through Jesus and how Jesus is the very voice of God. In the past, God would use prophets to speak to his people, but now he's used his very son, which makes the words that Jesus uses that much more important and significant. When we take communion, it's a time where we pause to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, how his body was beaten for our sin and how his blood was spilt to cover our sins. But today I'd like us to do something a little different. Today I'd like us, as awkward as it sounds, to just pause and listen for anything that Jesus might be speaking to us. God speaks very often throughout the Bible. He's not very shy. And I think that sometimes we just don't pause long enough or pause enough to listen to anything that Jesus might be saying to us. So we're going to try that today. And if in the midst of your listening and your pausing, if you don't hear or feel anything from God, well, in that case, we can always remember the beauty of the sacrifice that was made for us so that we can be connected to God again. But let's start this time of pausing and listening with some prayer. God, thank you so much. Thank you for sending your son and speaking through him, Lord. Today, we just practice your presence, and we just pause and we listen for anything that you may be revealing to us, God. Would you speak to us and give us the patience to keep listening when we don't hear you well? God, you're so good to us. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Friends, in response to his goodness, let's stand one more time. Online or in person, let's sing these words together as you know. As a church, as a family, as believers, as seekers, we find joy in him, amen? Because Saturday was silent. When has impossible ever stopped you? Because I didn't have to 
appointment was Sunday's empty tune. Since when is impossible ever stopped here? This is the sound. This is the sound of jaw bones rattling. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of dry bones rattling Yeah Got them rattle, come on No Pentecostal fire Still in something new You're not Resurrection power, it runs in my veins too. So much for joining us this day online or in person we're just so glad you're here next week we continue our series and learn about jesus as a representative of god god bless you all see you next time